Hello, everyone, and welcome to All Things, All Things Relative, um, Finding Your Family at the Library. Uh, just a couple um, housekeeping rules. Um, I ask that everyone please mute yourself Period. Um, while we are, um, while Kathy's presenting, just to kind of help limit distractions. And then if you do have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat while she's speaking and presenting. Um, if not, um, hold off and at the very end, we'll open up the floor to questions. So with that, Kathy, I turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Sean. So today we're gonna to talk about exploring online resources at the library, and we're gonna focus on the Monterey Library. But I will, with a caveat, is that um, some of these resources are available at any public library and the tools that we're gonna work with uh, you can apply to other databases that may be at your public library. And to have access to these resources, you will need to have a Monterey Public Library card, but that's easy to do if you live in California, and particularly if you live on the Monterey Peninsula. So you can just pick up a card and um, access these resources. But I encourage those of you who live outside the area to see what the resources are on your public library sites. And I'm, I think this is maybe a, something that librarians do, but whenever we're in another area, we always like to pop into public libraries and see what other libraries are doing. And I have quite a collection of library cards, I must admit, um, because I love databases and every library has different databases. And I know that I use the Los Angeles Public Library card for some databases, the San Francisco Public Library. Um, and so that might be a thought, something that might interest you as well. Okay, so let's get started. This is the homepage of the Monterey Public Library, and there are wonderful um, librarians and, and library staff. So here's the, the, the main page. And for those of you that do have a library card, and um, of course you can access these inside the library, but it, remotely you can go to online resources. And here we are. And this, I just love, online re resources. You can see there's ebooks and audiobooks. One of my very favorite databases is Novelist. And I like Novelist because you can put in a title of a book that you've read that you really liked, and this database will suggest other books that are like that. There's one for adults and there's one for kids. Here's career databases. Here's general reference. And here's history and genealogy. These are the ones we're going to focus on today. And I'm going to focus first on Heritage Quest, because that is one that is remote. Ancestry was kind enough to allow us to access the Ancestry database remotely during uh, COVID, but they have suspended that opportunity. And so um, Heritage Quest is a really good source to use at home. Other ones are World History, U.S. History, and Archives Unbound. And I'm gonna talk about each of these. I also wanna talk about two other favorites I have, which is the Monterey Historical Newspaper Database, which goes back to 1846, and the New York Times. Because we looked at our, our family in the con historical context. And so looking at the newspapers of the time, give us an idea of what's happening in their towns or in their areas. So let's start with Heritage Quest. The first step before we even get into a database is that we wanna identify the family branch or the individual. And you can see, this is just my mother's. This is a fan chart just of my mother's side. And you can see I've really gotten in, gone into depth with some lines in the part family, but others I haven't so much. And if you look at this, um, my mother's in the center. I have two grandparents. I have four great grandparents. I have eight great grandparents. I have 16 great great grandparents, goes up to 32 and 64. I have all of these stories that I can explore, but I have a lot of holes. And so I'm gonna be doing this for the rest of my life. Um, and it's exciting to fill in some of these blanks. So as you start and you get ready to use a database, you want to at least figure out some of these things. If you know the full names, that's great. And it's really important 
that you know the maiden name for your female ancestors. You may not find it yet, but in your search that you hopefully will come across that because that will allow you to have access to that line of the family. You want to find your birth, marriage, and death dates. And you want to find uh, the birth, marriage, and death locations. So those are things that um, you need to do before you get into your databases. Okay. So the resources that tell our family story are the vital records, the birth, marriage, and death records, the census, military records, immigration records, Freedmen's Bureau. The Freedmen's Bureau is an amazing resource for those that have enslaved um, family members, because this is really a record of the African-American history in our country. Um, newspaper articles, primary resources, which would be legislation, diaries, letters. So these are the ones that we want to get our hands on. And these are databases that provide those resources. And these are all free. And these are available at the Monterey Public Library and at many of your other public libraries. So we're going to look first at Heritage Quest, which is remote, Ancestry, which is available at the library, US History, World History, Archives Unbound, Historical Newspapers, which we also call the Digital Reel, and the New York Times. Now, Heritage Quest is connected to Ancestry. It is um, organized and run by ProQuest. ProQuest is an organization that provides databases to libraries. And so Heritage Quest is very much like Ancestry. And now that we can't remotely access Ancestry, Heritage Quest is a very good alternative because it has the census, it has family and local history books, it has wills and probates, it has city directories, it has military records, that's revolutionary and civil war records and pension lists. It's got immigration records, it's got public records, it's got the social security death index, and it has find a grave. So it's got, it's a really good place to start. And some of the things that I'm gonna share with you about Heritage Quest also apply to Ancestry. So if those of you who have an account with Ancestry might um, be able to use some of these things that we're gonna talk about. So I'm gonna start with the census. Um, Heritage Quest, as you can see, has uh, census records, search books, Revolutionary War. And if we go into this, we can see that and we look at other things. I mean, it's just, there's just an amazing amount of things here. Um, wills and probate, city directories, military records, immigration, all of this, it's all here on Heritage Quest. Again, looking at my, my chart, I'm interested in exploring Alex Ross. And those of you that have been with me for some of the other programs, remember that I talked about um, the Prunedale Ranch. Every home has a story. The fam my family that owned the Prunedale Ranch for nearly a hundred years. Alex Ross is the father of Helen Georgina Collins who owned that ranch, but I don't know too much about him. So I thought I'd start with him with Heritage Quest. So you can see this looks very much like Ancestry. And again, I'm putting in the information I know. I don't want to put too much information in, but I've put Alexander Ross. I've put the year he was born. I know he was born in Canada, and then he moved to Michigan. And I know his spouse, you'll see further down there, is Christina. So I do know a little bit about him, but I don't know a lot of the stories of, about him. Uh, this was a photo that was passed on down through my family. This is Alex Ross and four generations. Uh, the lady to the left is Helen Georgina Collins, the owner of the Prunedale Ranch. And the lady in the middle is my grandmother, Catherine, whom I'm named after. And um, the baby in the front is my aunt Helen. Now, these are names that some of you may have remember from other times we've met. So when I put in that information, Alex Ross, because I had enough information, came right up on the top. And there he is in the census in 1880, living in Birmingham, California. The census is a really important um, source because you can track your ancestors over time, their movements, and you can track the development of their families, the addition of children, 
You can track their personal resources, whether or not they owned land or how much money they have besides their land, their occupations, whether they immigrated, whether they fought in a war. The census has all kinds of information. And we can go back to 1790 with the census. And in fact, in April of this year, 1950, the census of 1950 will be available to us. Some of us will be in that census. And that is gonna be a really amazing experience. We're gonna talk more about that in a couple of months. But every 72 years, the census is released to the public. And it is 72 years in April uh, that the 1950 census was taken. The census is really important because it tells us who we are and where we're going. And it helps the government distribute funds to different communities, to different states. So a lot is determined on the census. It also helps a community decide where it's going. Um, does it need a new hospital? Does it need new schools? Does it need more areas to, for, for houses? Uh, so it's a very important document. And to see the 1950 census is pretty exciting. But this one is the 1880 census. And Alex Ross is in it. And here he is. Here's his family. He was in Birmingham, Oakland, Michigan at that time. Birmingham in the, in the county of Oakland in Michigan. And you can see his family members, Christina, his wife, and then his children. Also notice the neighbors right here. This is, this is really very interesting. Be sure and look at the neighbors on the census because these are people that will keep showing up in documents. These are their friends. They may have signed legal documents for them. They may be members of their church. The neighbors who live near them when the census was taken are people that play a role in their lives. Intermarriages, you'll see, um, you know, the daughter who married the son down at the farm next door. So check that out. Also, and this is also the case for Ancestry, there are suggested records here. And this is really helpful. You can see that I already see a death record. Um, Montana is a mistake. So he never was in Montana. So sometimes things get thrown in there that are mistakes. So you need to look at them and, and, and analyze them. There's an 1870 census, his marriage in Ontario to Christina, uh, vital records in Quebec and more death records. So those are places that you wanna explore. Also over here, if when you are using this, because you're using a database and, and it's not um, uh, personal information, you're not connected to an account, you might wanna send something that you find here back to your computer and you can do that. You can take screenshots, of course, but if you'd like to, to have access to say this document, which is the census, um, you can actually have that sent to you. So it's a good way to download and keep some of the records that you find on Heritage Quest. Now you see further down, there's Alex Ross and his family. Um, you'll see that it's really hard to read the categories that the census taker has uh, filled out information about at the top there. You really have to squint. So there are on Heritage Quest forms that show you what those different columns are. And I often put that form next to me while I'm figuring out what the different um, um, information is on a census. So here's Alex Ross blowing up a little bit. Um, you can see his wife, Christina. Um, you can see Alex Ross is Sunday school. He's a traveling agent. And what that means is he was a Presbyterian minister who was a circuit rider. And he would leave um, his town uh, in Michigan, which was in the uh, county of Oakland, Birmingham. And he would go out and visit the different people who um, needed to be married or whatever. And he'd distribute tracts, baptized. His wife, Christina, is keeping house. His daughter, Susie Ann, and his son um, are all in school or have no occupation. The, the little marks next to wife, daughter, and uh, son are the children are single and Alex and Christina are married. So there's some interesting information there. My um, great grandmother, Helen Georgina Collins, Ross Collins, is not here because she's already married, but these are the younger children. And you know, 
all of these people, they may just be in the census, you just see their names in the census, but they have a story. And in, I have these boxes in the garage that I haven't thoroughly gone through, but I was looking for something um, last year and I found a diary that he kept of his um, circuit uh, trips into uh, the area outside his town. And um, the reason why I picked the 1880 census is because this journal is dated 1879. And he says here, I left Flynn in the midst of a great snowstorm for elk to go round the road 15 miles, but going across a dense swamp full of water line timber cattails and grass 10 feet high, and he's not on a horse, he's walking, having no idea of what a terrible jungle it was, I crossed the swamp where I almost despaired of my life. I could not see a foot ahead for the blinding snow, the worst blizzard I have seen in Michigan. It was nearly dark when I got through the swamp and came to Scotch Hills in a man's house. The name of MacDonald, a widower with eight children. He had no way of keeping me overnight. So I gave him a lot of tracts, that would be church uh, publications, um, and walked three miles before I could get a place to lay my head. I finally came to the banks, a good man. He and his charming wife gave me a hearty welcome, although they never had seen or heard of me before. And when I told them my work, I was made to feel at home. So I have this plan that I'm going to go through and map out his journey um, that he uh, talks about in his journal of 1879. And I wanted to see where he actually was living in 1880. And the census helped me with that. Okay, so let's go to the next. Hmm, let's see. I'm going to go back and see what happened here. Okay. Now, the other thing that Heritage Quest has is digitized thousands of family history books. And this is amazing. Also, you can put in your name of your person. I'm going to try Aaliyah, which is a revolutionary family member of mine, and see what books um, Heritage Quest has. You can see I can search by people, I can search by the name or keyword of a publication, and I can search by city directories. So when I put in Aaliyah, who was a, a revolutionary patriot, I can see that a number of books turn up and I can click on this and I can look more into those books. This is probably a very good source up here because he did marry into a Dutch family. It, they're a Huguenot family that came from France landed in Staten Island in Manhattan or in New York, and then moved down into New Jersey, and he married into a Dutch family. So here we are with some possibilities. These are all on Heritage Quest. So you might be able to find your ancestor or a family history that includes your ancestor. You also can just put the title in, and I put Westfield in, Westfield, New Jersey, because that's a town I'm really familiar with. I visited it, and I see two books that could be really helpful and have been very helpful. Colonial Westfield, past and present, being a history of the town of Westfield, New Jersey. And then the commemorative history of the Presbyterian Church in Westfield. This is the Presbyterian Church in Westfield. I visited it and these are the graves of my ancestors. And these are two books fully digitized that are on Herit in Heritage Quest. So you too might find something like this, just by putting the town where your family lived. Now the city directory complements the census because it allows us to track our family members um, and their locations. This would be like the phone book. Um, Daniel Monroe, my lawyer, great grandfather who lived in Monterey and later Hollister and later San Francisco was in San Francisco in 1906. Um, I see that he, was, he didn't die till 1912. Here's a directory of him in 1909 is another one. The other Daniel Monroe Jr. is his son. And my Daniel Monroe, uh, my great grandfather had already passed on by these years. But if I look at this, I can see that where he lived in 1912, 1041 Lincoln Way, I can see that he was in San Francisco. And here's a page from the book. And there he is with his children 
in the 1912 uh, directory. Now, what you want to do is start to keep a timeline of these different sources that you're finding. So I know that, um, you know, in 1880, he may be in a certain place in the census. I know in 1912, he was in San Francisco. So you can track your, your family. So this is in large what the uh, directory said, it said that his residence is 1041 Lincoln Way, and this is the house where he lived. Um, his son, was with Standard Oil Company, lived down the street, 1039 Lincoln Way. Um, e. Um, Monroe is not a member of the family, but Hubert Monroe is another son, and he was the Humboldt Savings Bank, and he had a residence at 175. They don't give the street, I don't know what that is, uh, on 7th, well, I guess 7th Avenue, but they don't give the um, address of the Humboldt Savings Bank, but I could find that. So my mother always said that um, during, the, during the time of the earthquake, 1906, that the two sons worked downtown for Standard Oil and Humboldt Savings, or she did not know what the bank was. But I know, now I know because of this directory. And I know that my great-grandfather lived at Lincoln Way. Now we can also search for a Revolutionary War person, another one. This is for the War Pension and Bonte Land War application files of another revolutionary ancestor, Perrine, in New Jersey as well. And here he is, James Perrine. And here's more information about the widow's pension application file. His widow applied for a pension for his service in the Revolutionary War. And these slips, these are revolutionary uh, slips that give a little bit of information about a revolutionary um, patriot. And you can see that he served in 1794, which had been towards the end, and he died in 1811. So he was on record with um, the national records as having served. So she applied and she sent, she must have ripped this out because they don't have, we didn't have copy machines when she applied, um, but she needed to prove that he had died and she took pages from this book of sermons, which had James Perrine, um, New Jersey, um, death date 1811. And that was with her pension file. And that is on Heritage Quest. So you may be able to find something um, along this line with um, Heritage Quest. Okay, so now going back to this, I want to... Um, show you again, we looked at the census, I want to look at, um, right now I want to look at wills and probates. So let's go, let's go back and see what we can see with that. Okay. If you go into wills and probates, you can identify the state that you're interested in. I'm interested in California right here. And I can put in my John Willis Green. John Willis Green is my, um, is my Hollister relative. And um, he was, came out to California during the gold rush. I put in his uh, date of death, 1905 in Hollister, pulled it up. And there he is, because I had enough information, there is a probate record for John Willis Green in Heritage Quest. And here it is. Again, I can send this document home if I want. And here is a probate record. Um, so it, it went through in 1905. Uh, he died actually the beginning of the year. And the, the executors are um, Jacob Luther, who is a son-in-law. That's good to know who his daughter married into, married into the Luther family. They lived in Hollister. And the handwriting on the side is um, Jacob swears to uphold the constitution. The handwriting on the side is Grace, Grace, his second wife, who wrote that she also swore to uphold the, the constitution. So here is the probate record, giving me some names of the son-in-law and the fact when this went through. I, I need, I, I wanna find the will, but I haven't found that yet. And this is his land in Hollister. This is in a, a, one of the biographical books that we've talked about. Uh, so this was definitely part of the will, and uh, I believe Grace, Grace received this. 
Now the social security death that you see all these things that are on Heritage Quest and you can do this at home, which is so wonderful. Um, the social security death index is a way of finding out when someone died. And then you can take that date and go looking for their obituary. So James Lyons, who is a, was a dear uncle of mine, um, was born in 1898 and he died in 1977 in Casterville. This is the, the farmer, the dairy farmer that I've talked a little bit about. And there he is, there's the social security index record, comes right up and here's information, his social security number. But what I wanted to know was when he died. I wasn't sure of the month when he died. And now I know it's December, 1977, right there. And now I can start to look for his obituary. You can do this for uh, uh, anyone who has a social security number. You should be able to find the birth of their, their death. So in the library, when, when people call up and are looking for an obituary, but they don't know uh, when that person died, um, this is a good, this, the librarians use this as a source to then look for the obituary. So here is his obituary. This actually found in Ancestry um, because Ancestry does have newspaper obituaries. And this is a picture of me and my brother with my uncle on his, uh, with one of his buggies um, on Blakey Road in Casterville, where his dairy farm was, right down the street from the Collins family. The, um, my uncle was very proud of the fact that he was an extra in East of Eden with James Dean. He was hired to drive his buckboard across the, the screen and we all had fun um, looking at that movie and seeing him um, uh, in, for his short little part in the movie. So that I found his obituary and with a social security uh, index. Now find a grave. This is, this is one of the last things we're gonna talk about with Heritage Quest. Find a Grave is a whole separate website, which you can access just with your browser. Um, find a Grave is a volunteer organization. People go out and take pictures of tombstones, and then they post them on Find a Grave uh, in connection with the cemetery. It's a wonderful source when you're doing a genealogy road trip, because you can go into Find a Grave and you can find all of your family members that are in a certain graveyard, you take that list, you go to the graveyard and you can track them all down. Um, and I've done this on a number of occasions, but I find that the website that is, and it's a good idea to sign, to actually um, develop an account if you wanna use that website because you have more information, more access to information. But I find it easier to use Heritage Quest or Ancestry to get into uh, Find a Grave Index and Heritage Quest and Ancestry both have access to it. So I put in James Lyons and I put in the information that I know about him. And here he is, Salinas, he's buried in Salinas in, in uh, Salinas, uh, which is a garden of memories. And uh, someone, a volunteer, not necessarily a family member, but someone who is um, a volunteer and very interested in this took a picture of the, the grave site of my grandma, of my um, uncle and my aunt. And um, I can actually go directly to find a grave and I can look at the website with that, this URL, URL link right here. I do wanna say that um, find a grave is really helpful because it gives you, sometimes people will post an obituary there, they'll post pictures, they'll post a story. Um, so it's one to, to explore and, and, and look into. So anyway, that's find a grave and um, I highly recommend it. Okay, so now let's look at Ancestry. Now I know this homepage of Ancestry does not look like the homepage of Ancestry for those who have a subscription. This is the library edition of Ancestry. Again, um, uh, uh, promoted by ProQuest. This is Heritage Quest. You can see how similar they are. Heritage Quest um, is remote. Ancestry is available free at the library. Same things, census records, a lot of the same things. There are three things though that Ancestry uh, at the library has that Heritage Quest does not have. It has access to public member trees, it has message boards, 
and it has newspaper obituaries. So those are some additions to um, what is at the library. The Ancestry Library Edition has 11 billion documents, which is about what the subscription um, Ancestry has. It is, primary, it is only records. It is not any personalized features like a subscription would have. Heritage Quest has 5 billion documents. Not, not shabby by any means, but it has uh, about half what the Ancestry Library Edition has. Ancestry has a lot of research aids if you're looking for help with the census or you're looking for help with, with finding something. It has a card catalog and I'll show you how that works in just a minute. It has public member trees and has a message board. So those are things that Ancestry has that Heritage Quest doesn't have. So what I recommend is that you exhaust Heritage Quest at home download those documents that you find, get your timeline going, and then when you feel comfortable, go into the library and use the free edition at the library to supplement what you've already found. And this is the research aids that the library has. You can see that um, there's getting started, things about the census, um, just to help you in terms of using Ancestry. There's finding aids like uh, your Canadian ancestors and your Swedish ancestors, and it just gives you a uh, little background information and, and helps you get going. But one thing that Ancestry has, and this applies to you, those of you that have a subscription and that the library edition has, is a card catalog. And you ask, well, what, why do I need this? I mean, I just put my, my name in, my information, and it comes up. I, what, why do I need a card catalog? Well, some of these databases are not indexed. Ancestry has indexed many databases, but some are not indexed. And so if you're looking, and probate and wills are one example, land records are other examples. If you're looking for a specific uh, thing and you can't find it, go into the card catalog, put in what you're looking for. And here I put uh, something in the title, I wanted New Jersey and I wanted to find a death database. And it pulled up the databases that are specifically from New Jersey and specifically deal with death. And now I can go into some of these, I can see there's a, a you know, the years, here's um, uh, this one is not what I would want, but obituary index 1848 and would be Warren County. Um, here's the abstract of wills. I can go through and I can see what database might be helpful. I go into that database and I look for the index within the database, like at the very front or the very back. And then I look for um, my person. You may have to go through, it's sort of like using microfilm uh, that we have over time. You have, may have to go through the different slide, slides of each one, but this is a way of picking up more information than is in that basic search um, window that we love and, and is so easy to use. Oh. But that's what the card, card catalog is all about. So do not try it. Try it with Ancestry Library. Try it with your subscription. Now, public member trees, uh, stories, um, newspaper obits, obits are also um, part of Ancestry. And here's the public tree. Um, again, this is the, the window for putting in, I put in Alexander Ross, um, my uh, Canadian uh, uh, Michigan uh, minister, 1824 to 1914. And I see that Grant and Crafts family have a tree. They have a tree and Alexander Ross is on it. Now I know this is my guy because his spouse is Christina McBain, and these are his dates, and this is where he was living and where he died. Um, I didn't know who his parents were. So someone has done some research and has found out that his father was Malcolm Ross and his uh, mother was Barbara McRae. So that's good information. Also, this person has attached records and has 22 sources. Now that's good. They're not just putting things up from hearsay. They've actually gone in and looked at sources. And when I go into that family tree, I can see that there is an outline, a timeline of Alexander Ross. 
his life story. Now, this is not available um, on Heritage Quest. Also, some of the sources that they've used. Now, Montana, again, is wrong, but here's Ontario. I can go into these sources. And again, I can also download these to my computer. And here they put a time of, of, of family tree together. And I can click on any of these. I can look up Mal Malcolm Ross, Barbara McRae. Now, don't take this, um, uh, this as, as the absolute word. You need to go and check this out because people make mistakes. So don't incorporate this into your own uh, family tree until you've checked it out. But it's a great way to find hints. It's a great way. And this is available at the library at Ancestry. Now, this family tree has also posted a lot of pictures, and you can download these pictures and, and keep them on your computer. I didn't find any of Alexander Ross, but these are other members of the family. Also, they will post stories. And although this is not a member of the Ross family, this is someone on their tree. They did post a story. Also, you can post audio and you can post video. So there's a lot of things. Here's the family tree. Here's my Alexander Ross and Christina McBain. And here is um, the parents. And here's his siblings. And uh, one of his siblings married Susan McDonald. And here's all his children and, and the marriages of the children. So these are hints that can help me as I put the story together. Ancestry has charts and forms. It has, you can download a pedigree chart if you want to fill that in as you, as you start to put your, your information together. You can download a correspondence record. This is so critical um, because you have conversation or correspondence with someone and then their name pops up again through Ancestry or another database. And you don't wanna be writing them again, forgetting that you had this elaborate correspondence with them before. So I would recommend that you keep a record of who you're corresponding with so you don't repeat yourself. Um, uh, that would be horrible to do. So um, that's just a way of keeping track of who you're, who you're writing to. Okay, so how is this Ancestry Library Edition different from the Ancestry subscription that some of us have? Well, first, the Ancestry subscription is expensive. It's several hundred dollars. Um, so it is an investment. Um, but there are advantages to that subscription if you want a personalized um, Ancestry uh, account because you can do some things with it. You can develop your own family tree and it can be a way of keeping all your records, keeping track of, of your research. You receive periodically hints, they're little shaky leaves that are attached to your tree that say, hey, look at this, this is a new development. You might wanna check this out. You can take your own documents and attach them to your tree. So it's your personal tree with your documents uh, supporting your research. And if you've done DNA, you see your DNA results and you can use the tools and you can communicate with cousins and other members through email. You can't do these things with the library edition because these are all personal and the library edition is documents, it's, it's research, but the subscription allows you to personalize it. One tip is that you can do a 14 day free trial, get all organized, get your ref, you get everything you wanna do, try it for 14 days and then uh, suspend your subscription. Another tip is if you're an ARP member, uh, the first year you can get a third off the price. So um, those are, are some tips about the subscription. Okay, now getting back to um, some other databases that are on, I just wanna show you again, online resources. Just wanna show you these, um, these other ones that I really like and I think that they're really helpful. That's World History, Archives Unbound, U.S. History, New York Times, and the Historic Monterey Newspapers. So let's look first at U.S. History. The reason why I like this is because, you know, our, our ancestors are not in a vacuum. They lived in terms of what was happening in the country at the time of their life. And what was happening had a lot to do with the decisions they made about their life. So this is an interesting um, discovery I had. Um, I discovered this on Ancestry, but then I went looking for polygamy in Utah. 
because I do have an ancestor who was a, a, a Mormon in 1888, and he did have several wives, and he did go to prison. He was a great uncle. And I wanted to know more about what happened with the polygamy in Utah. So I got into um, U.S. history, and I started to look about when the law was came into effect, um, the case, Reynolds versus United States, a ladies' anti-polygamy society. And there were a number of articles about this that gave me more information about this great uncle, or at least about the situation he was in. And I found a newspaper article. It says in the first district of Provo, um, different people were fined. You see Victor Sandgren, um, my cousins that are on, that's the Anderson side of the family. Um, uh, Frederica's uh, brother, Victor Sandgren of Pleasant Grove was sentenced to six months imprisonment and a hundred dollars fine. So he was in jail for six months uh, and his two wives uh, in uh, Utah in Pleasant Grove um, continued to run his farm and his take care of his children while he was in prison. So I was looking for some background information and this was great. I also have homesteaders in the Dakotas and uh, our Anderson family. And um, I was interested in the law. Here's the, the Homestead Act of 1862. I wanted to know how it was worded and what, um, what were the requirements to get 160 acres. And so the law is there and a little bit about homesteading. And this is a sod um, house, which of course they had to, in order to acquire this land, they had to be living on it. And there are not a lot of trees on the prairie in the Dakotas. So the first houses that people built were usually of sod. So this gave me some more flavor and more context to the story of my ancestors, to the documents I was finding about my ancestors. Now, as far as world history, I was interested in the great Genealogy and history is all about being curious. And you go down these rabbit holes. Oh, I'd like to find out about that. I'd like to explore this. And I think that's what's fun about it, is, if, is asking yourself questions, being curious, and then going on the search. And um, I was interested, of course, in the, the flu epidemic. I don't have any family members that I know that died of the flu. Maybe some of you do. But I was interested in a little bit of the background. And I found in this article, there were some pictures of the Red Cross nurses and uh, again, the masks, um, people working in an office and, and um, uh, the nurses in, in, uh, uh, were, were making masks for soldiers actually. And then I found also as interested in, in the World War II nurses, my father um, was a pharmacist on a Red Cross train during uh, World War II and had a lot of contact with nurses. The Red Cross train went in to um, uh, picked up Holocaust survivors, um, wounded soldiers, and prisoners of war. And um, he took a lot of I, he took a lot of pictures of his experience, you know, displaced people and, and the trains. I wanted to find out more about the role of the nurses, and so I looked in uh, to the World History uh, database, and I looked in that. So if you are looking for the context of your ancestors, use these databases, they're really great. Um, Archives Unbound is primary sources. Um, here's Birth Control Review, 1923, Margaret, edited by Margaret Sanger. This is her, was her magazine. The other one is the Women Voter Bulletin um, in 1929 when women were voting. So these are three databases that really give you context for your, um, your, your ancestors. This is the one that is the historical newspapers in Monterey. Now, those of you outside of the area, check your public library and see if they have digitized your local newspapers. Um, these are the different newspapers that have been in Monterey over time, going back to 1846. And anybody can use this. This is, you don't need a library card for this, but you can put in um, your topic and then you will find the article, uh, the complete article. I put in David Jacks and David, I put in David Jacks because my Collister, San Francisco Monterey great grandfather had business dealings with David Jacks. I don't know exactly what they were. I would love to know. I know that my great grandfather was the lawyer. It could have been legal. Um, I also know he's a sheep raiser. He could have, um, you know, leased land from David Jacks. David Jacks, many of you know, was um, a large land developer. 
And he had over 25,000 acres in the, on the Monterey Peninsula, from Monterey to Pacific Grove, to Delray Oaks, to Pebble Beach, to the Fort Ord area. Um, he ended up owning about 35,000 acres, acres. And he would buy land, many of them ranchos, uh, Mexican land grant ranchos, and he acquired them and then he'd lease his land out. And he wasn't always the kindest man if, if there was a, he'd also sold land and he was had no problem foreclosing on people. So his reputation is a little mixed, but, um, and I don't know what relationship my grandfather, my great grandfather had. These are, this is my great grandfather and my great grandmother. But they came down in 1870 to Monterey. And I wanted to see what David, and I, my understanding was that he connected with David Jacks. I wanted to see what David Jacks was doing in 1870, 1871. And I found two things that were of interest. One is that he was the largest landowner in the, in, on the peninsula. And secondly, he, the papers are just have one ad after another. He is trying to lease or he is uh, advertising his land to uh, lease suitable for dairy sheep raising and farming and quantities to suit and on reasonable terms. And down here, roadhouse, 200 acres of land. I think this Richardson's crossing maybe by Tarpies because he owned that area over there. Um, but anyway, he was leasing land on the Salinas River uh, to industrious family. And I wonder if my grandfather leased land for him because I do in a directory have found out that he was a sheep, a sheep, raised sheep. So that was really interesting to me to give a little background of, of what was happening to David Jacks when my family came down to um, Monterey. Now let's move to the New York Times, another amazing and great resource. Um, and this is available on the library website uh, with the library card. Um, you may remember those of you that were with me last month, we talked about my the women's right to vote and how California gave women the right to vote in 1912. And these two great aunts, Aunt Todd, Aunt Ella May, and Anna, who lived at 1041 um, Lincoln Way, were able to vote in that 1912 election. And I went in and saw, you may remember this, I went in and I looked for the voter registration, and I saw that this Monroe family all voted for different people, or at least registered for different people. They reg one registered Republican, one registered Democrat, one re registered um, Progressive, which was Theodore Roosevelt, another registered for Eugene Debs. They all had different votes. So I thought, I'm going to look in the New York Times and see if there was an article about California women uh, and their first opportunity to vote. And so I looked at the date after that election, November 6th, 1912, and I saw that um, the women played an even more important part in California than was expected at the first national election in which they cast their ballots. From all the large cities come reports of great activity of women in bringing voters of their own sex to the polls and in doing effective work against such vicious, little editorializing here, measures as that which sought to reopen racetracks throughout the state. In one precinct in San Francisco, 80 women appeared to work against this racetrack amendment and to urge voters to cast their ballots against State Senator Wolf, who had championed the racetrack measure. Well, I, I think this is fascinating. I wonder if my aunts took a position on the racetrack amendment. I wonder if they were out there um, uh, encouraging their, their women friends to vote. Um, so the New York Times can give us some background information. In every, every home has a story. This is the Prunedale Ranch that I talked about. And I talked about how um, the ranch was divided in half by the building of the 1931 Highway 101 and how it split the ranch in half and the impact it had on my family. And these are photos that my family took of the building of Highway 101 near Prunedale. I thought, well, wait a minute, what's happening? Is, there, is, this railroad is this road building, highway building only in California? No, in 1931, Hoover had put in all kinds of money to build highways all over the United States. Here's Highway 101, which was built in 1931, um, but you can see there were roads all over. So I looked in the New York Times and I saw that, um, road building in connection with other enterprise felt the pinch of the depression in 1933. 
and it talked about the contraction in expenditures for construction and maintenance to less than 1 billion, which is a decline of 40% from 1933. So roads were being built to accommodate the new purchase of automobiles. This was a time of, of, of a lot of travel with automobiles. It was a depression, so people were gonna be impacted by that. But I thought that the New York Times had some good uh, information to help me with that building of Highway 101 through my family's farm. So basically, um, it's about being curious. It's about figuring out um, what your family is doing at a certain time, and then looking at it in the historical context. And Heritage Quest, World, US, Archives Unbound, historical newspapers, and the New York Times can all be accessed in your home remotely if you have a Monterey Public Library card. There are other databases just like this on other public library sites, and some of them will have these, some of these very ones. Ancestry can be accessed at the library, also free. So give these databases a try and start to pull your ancestor story together. Back to um, our homepage, I want to share something else with you that might be helpful if you are access our site, try out the California History Room. I am a big fan of the California History Room. And on the California History Room um, page, you'll see some of the things that are there, archival collections, images, etc. But here are some local history links. So for those of you that do have Monterey family, check out these links. This might give you some, um, some more information. For those of you who do not have Monterey family, check out these general genealogy links. And two things I want, do want to point out, you see this tracing history of your house. When we talked about every home has a story, this was a handout that we talked about. If you are tracing the history of your house, you might check this PDF out. And also I wanted to point out a recording that I did a couple of years ago, which is searching for your roots at the library. And it's on the YouTube channel, the Monterey YouTube channel. And um, I talk about finding things in the California History Room. So if you do have Monterey people and you do want to use the California History Room, you might watch this first for some tips on things to look for that the California History Room has. And I would be remiss if I didn't talk about one major free database, and that's familysearch.org. That's connected to the Family History Library in Salt Lake City, the largest genealogy library in the world. And their database is free. You can access simply by signing up um, and do sign up because you, there are, you have more resources if you do. It is free, has billions of records. You may search records. It has family trees. It has a catalog, card catalog, just like we talked about with Ancestry. It has digitized books and it has a wiki to help you navigate it. So while you're checking out the Monterey Public Library um, website, be sure and check out familysearch.org. It is every bit as big and as thorough as Ancestry and it's absolutely free. Uh, it is um, a Latter-day Saints um, um, uh, organization um, because that is part of the um, um, beliefs of the Latter-day Saints, but we are very fortunate that they share this with us. And this organization, Family Search, is um, has coming up March 3rd through 5th, a Roots Tech virtual uh, conference, which is absolutely am amazing. Um, I've been back four times to Salt Lake City for the in-person one, and that's pretty amazing. But last year when it went virtual, um, they really created a, a feeling of being there. And I recommend that you sign up for this. This is absolutely free. It goes on for three days and hundreds of classes. So if you are looking for um, learning more about genealogy, this is a good place to start. And, and I mean, there's so much going on around here. <laughs> also, um, this is one of the first conferences that I went to uh, 10 years ago. This is put on by the Daughters of the American Revolution. It is a uh, ancestor roundup. They have it every year. This is, I think, their 41st um, conference. And it is going to be virtual as well. 
It's usually held at the Family History Center, but it is virtual. There will be about 19 different classes. And that's in two weeks, that's in a week, uh, January 22nd. So that's, it was my first one that I went to and that hooked me to, um, on, to genealogy. So I recommend that one as well. And now what about us, all things relative? What's coming up? Well, um, I hope your desk doesn't quite look like this. I know that at times ours are all pretty messy, but next month, we're gonna talk about what we do with all of those documents that we just found. How do we get organized? Where do we put them? How do we find them after we've, we've, we've how do we find them again? So next month, we're gonna, let's get organized. And that will be Thursday, February 10th at four o'clock. And I hope that I'll see you all then. Um, and in the meantime, I know Sean is really happy, happy to answer any questions and there's his email. And I too am happy to answer any questions. And if you are interested in Off the Charts, which is our storytelling group, please email me and I'll send you a link for next Wednesday. So I hope that you will try some of these free resources and that you will find documents that will help you develop the story of your ancestors. And I, I look forward to hearing about some of those finds that you have. So I'm gonna... Um, Stop sharing and open it up to questions. And Sean, I'll let, turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Kathy, for all of that information. That was, thank you so much. Um, right now, the floor is open for anyone who has questions. Um, please feel free to unmute yourself, uh, type it into the chat. Uh, looks like we have one comment in the chat. Um, at Find a Grave with a free membership, one can create virtual cemeteries where the, the Find a Grave record for all the members of a given family can be grouped together for easy review later on. It does not require that everyone be buried in the same cemetery. Think of it as a handy file folder for all the burial information for your ancestral family. I organize my virtual cemeteries by ancestral surnames. You know, Gail, thank you. That's that's a really good reminder is that there are links to members of the family who are buried in other cemeteries. So it is, in a sense, provides family tree information. So um, check out Family Grave. It's an amazing resource. Any other questions? Well, oh, Jenny, I see. Just have one um, with the Heritage Quest. Does it have many records that are not U.S. related? Oh, My family is almost entirely immigrants. I mean, go back two generations and we're not here. So it, it yes, it's is not, there. not as plentiful, but there are some. So check it out. Um, you'll see down at the bottom, I think some of the other countries that are mentioned are, are on the website. But no, it is not. Um, uh, that is not a focus of, of Heritage Quest, but Ancestry definitely is. Yeah, I'm an Ancestry member, so. Oh, um, good, so you know, yes. Okay. Great. And does the library have access to my heritage or find my past at all? No, but um, the Family History Center uh, on Plumas right. and Buena Noche does have uh, access to those databases. And they are open on Tuesday mornings and Thursday afternoons. I would actually uh, contact them just to confirm that. And they do, they are accepting people. They do limit how many people are there at a time, but yes, they are free and uh, you can use, those are two other wonderful subscription sites. Good question, Jenny. Thank you. Okay. I hope that I know I, I lots of information today, um, but I hope that some of the tips that I gave you, you can apply to your ancestry wow. subscription. I spent a lot of time on Heritage Quest because I know people um, that gives people an opportunity to work at home, but I hope that those tips might be helpful. Okay. Oh, Peggy. Hey. Kathy, I just wanted to thank you for the tips that you've given us in the past. The one that helped me the most was start small mm -hmm. and don't feel like you have to do everything, you know, within a week, but uh, just keep chipping away and, you know, decide one person or something that you want to find, stick with it, and then you feel so successful. So thank you for that tip. That's really been helpful. 
Thank you, Peggy, for reminding us that we don't have to get overwhelmed. Um, that uh, just someone who interests you, who you're curious about and stick with them for a while. And then when you hit a brick wall, try someone else because you maybe have an opening when you get back to them. Okay, anyone else? Well, it's lovely to see you all. Um, I wish you uh, uh, great discoveries this next month. And I look forward to seeing you next month as we get organized. Thank you very much, Kathy. And um, this presentation will be, is recorded and will be put on the Monterey Public Library's YouTube channel. So please feel free to revisit uh, this presentation. And like Kathy said, we will be doing this next month. So please feel free to register at the Monterey Public Library's website on the event page. And I'll be sending emails out, uh, reminders of the upcoming programs. And just a very special thank you to Kathy for spending time with us and providing us with such great information. And um, I hope everyone has a great evening. Thank you, Sean. And good to see you all. See you next month.